if you let somebody figure out how to do what you want them to do, they'll organize their system and learn properly, right? If you give too many commands, it's like, if I, if I lose one of those commands or a strategy, I fall apart, and that's not helpful. It's too much to think about. So your cues do need to be simple, but again, cues should reinforce strategies. If you're giving someone a new cue that they don't know how to perform in you know a static standing position, your cues are too hard. Very lucky to have Jay DeSherry on the Run DNA podcast episode this time. Had some really fun conversations. Definitely got a little nerdy and it was a lot of fun there. Valuable though, both for the runner as well as for the running specialist. Jay literally wrote the book on gait analysis. And uh, I think that it is a really fun just to hear about his knowledge and, and how he became an expert. And then we even dive into a lot of case studies and we share a case study and and how I've kind of handled one of these professional runners. And then Jay provides some insight as well on what he would do. So a wealth of knowledge, love uh, just having time to share with Jay here. He and I are at the Two Bald Guys podcast. We've joked in the past. So a lot of fun pearls in this and hope you enjoy this episode of the Run DNA podcast. Hi everyone, Doug Adams here from Run DNA Podcast, and I am very excited for today. This is a little bit of a reunion of the Two Bald Guys podcast here. Uh, I've got Jay DeSherry on here, very excited. Um, Jay and I have gotten to know each other over the years, and he's just a wealth of information. Um, so I'm going to give a little introduction to him, but we've got some really fun things to dive in and talk about. Uh, I think if you're involved in the running world at all, you probably know Jay, or at least his books and, and the work that he's putting out there. He really built his reputation as an expert in biomechanics when he was at UVA as the director of the speed clinic uh, at University of Virginia. And this is where he started to blend some fields of like engineering and physical therapy and biomechanics and put some things together that has really led to some uh, just really, I mean, he literally wrote the book on running. So it, it just his philosophy on that with Running Rewired and Anatomy for Runners. I, these are books that I recommend to all of my athletes just to understand themselves better and, and get some exercise recommendations. So I think he's gone on and he's the creator of most mobile board, which is something that we have here at my clinic, Omega Project, and something that we have all of our athletes use. I think it's a great one. And his mobile board site has great uh, exercise instructions and some really good ideas. So um, as well as publications, I mean, I could I could go on here. He's faculty at OSU for the PT program. Definitely somebody just a wealth of knowledge. And um, I want to jump in and Jay, add anything that I forgot or so, but something Jay and I've never talked about. I'd be really curious just his days at UVA and really, you know, what was that like? And how was that when you were really designing some of the things that now you really are putting into play in your career? You know, what was that time like? And, and what was the most helpful things for you? And I'd, I'd love to learn more about your time at UVA. Yeah. Um, first, Doug, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's great to get two ball guys together again. Um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, when I look back and it's kind of funny, right? We had this, like, you imagine, you know, people talking about their graduating class, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of us at that time at University of Virginia talk about our graduating class, um, even though we're like employees, right? But we, we had just the most absolutely amazing, incredible collaborative environment between tons of departments. Like it was literally I mean, I'm going to totally sound like a dork and a nerd saying this, but like it was it was all you could ask for in the realm of sports performance biomechanics at the time. Like everybody was totally centered on how can we do a better job? There was no ego game going on. Like I was by far the dumbest person in the room. Like, I mean, it, it was hilarious, right? I'm saying a lot. Yes. And, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it's um, yes. Yeah, so I'll give people a little background, right? So um uh, I, so I worked for the um, Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab under the School of Medicine at Even University of Virginia, and we had well, at the time I was actually working at a um, it was UVA Health South, so basically it was an orthopedic clinic run by Health South, so it wasn't really University mm -hmm. of Virginia in name what it was, but um, so um, I was there for five years, and uh, we had a department chair come in to, to the UVA side, name was Dr. Casey Kerrigan. 
came down from Harvard. She had a huge startup uh, startup fund. She did a bunch of work on walking biomechanics and really was looking at the influence of high heeled shoes, uh, specifically for women, uh, as hmm. it relates to um, over acceleration uh, development of uh, osteoarthritis in the knee. That's like her line of tractor research for forever. And um, and she had a huge startup package when she came to UVA and um, she bought all the toys, right? So she yeah she she basically bought the second instrumented treadmill in the entire world right the first one was at a, a natick mill uh natick research uh base in massachusetts they were number one and we had number two and that was it right so um and and uh you know we had a, a motion capture system we had I mean, it, literally every single toy in the whole world like i cannot tell you how many researchers from all over the world came to visit our lab right it was like the gold standard of let's make a sports biomechanics lab um and it was done right like it, all the little details like you know when you read a study and you watch about you know people ran over ground like the problem with an overground study is you're always accelerating and then you're decelerating. And like I was right. talking to some of my students the other day, like these studies that come out, when you look at the method section, you look at how data was captured, are you really in a steady state running velocity or not? Right. So all those little details matter. And we actually took into account those things. We designed our lab, right? You want to do running cutting studies, you have to allow people distance to accelerate, distance to decelerate, right? Crash yeah. mass to hit full speed, right? These little details matter. And what instrumented treadmills like to do is get steady state data, right? So you can have right. people run at a specific velocity and you can change velocity. You can change the incline, the decline, all kind of stuff, right? So our treadmill went from uh, flat to uh, to positive 25 degrees to negative 25 degrees. Oh, cool. And it was a and it was an interesting design. So it basically had one big belt that was three feet wide and about um, five and a half feet long. And then we had, in front of it, we had two belts that ran in tandem, right? Um, uh, so you get walking gait because when you on a force plate, you can't capture uh, two feet on one belt. You have to be on different belts. Yeah. So we can yep. use the different. We had three belts moving in, uh, in tandem the whole time. Well, two in tandem and one behind uh, yeah. in parallel. Right. Um, and so it allowed us to get different gait patterns. Right. Walking and then running. You only need one uh, belt. But it just allowed us to get any gait pattern. We can look at tons of stuff and walking and running gait. And we had all the tools. And again, I always tell people I can give you the best, you know, tools in the whole world, if you don't know how to use them, you can't do anything, right? So, right. you know, you don't buy this equipment at Target, right? You need to custom code everything. And so, um, you know, we had we had just research rooms from all over the place, like, you know, at, at our disposal. And it was great because you say, okay, how can I look at this? And you say, okay, well, what do you want to look at? And how do we design software setup, hardware configuration to do this, right? And so- yeah. We had this brain trust of people. And then we had all these like brilliant minds that would sit together in rooms like every week and have these great lab meetings and talk about what can we do to advance, you know, one department's goals or our department's goals. Right. And so um, it was just amazing. Right. So I, so I kind of worked my way into, into that lab and ended up running that lab. And we, we had a bunch of projects funded for everybody from NIH to DARPA. Um, and it was amazing. Right. So yeah. um, one day I, I walked into my department chair's office and said, hey, look, this is really cool. I love doing research. You love doing research. But like the equipment isn't booked all the time. And you know what would be really cool if we started looking at stuff at like N of one? She's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, what if like anybody could actually come in and get an individual specific biomechanical analysis, but not just give somebody, you know, a bunch of stuff and say, you know, here's your report, right? We've actually yeah. go back and take that data and correspond it back with a musculoskeletal analysis and then like correlate clinically what we, we can measure with biomechanic data, right? And then what rises to the surface? And she's like, what do you want to measure? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Everything and anything so until new. I figure yeah. out what's important. Yeah. It was so new. So I I went to, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say this, I went to the library and I just stayed there for like four months and I read every single article out there, right? And, you know, try to get, uh, uh, try to establish some type of system, right? To, of things we want to look at, how to look at them, how to measure, how to filter these things, right? And so I'll, I'll be I'll be honest and say, you know, like anything, right? There's trial and error at first. And so yeah. our first year or so, there was a lot of kind of going back and forth on how we massage algorithms and what, how we look at breakpoints and how we filter data and so forth like that. But um, after a while, it's like stuff started to become pretty pretty interesting. Um, mm. And we started to get very confident in our methodology. And, you know, some of the stuff we use for research, we actually use for individual, you know, aspects of like taking some of the data points and some of the stuff we did was new ways to categorize systems, right? Building new models to look at how the foot works, build different models to look at different types of gait abnormalities, right? And so um, it, was a, it was an amazing time. Like it literally, you had all the toys you wanted, all the people you wanted who were smart enough to build these things. Um, and 
it was just an amazing time in relationships and relationships and, and building a system. And um, I, I learned more than I ever had. I probably, somebody joked, they said, you've probably forgotten more than most people ever learn about gate analysis. And that's in probably time, true. Um, it's, <laughs> it's because I was just in it, right? Just um, living and breathing it there. I mean, that, like anytime we have experts on here, I talk to anybody that's like an expert in their field. I mean, the things that stand out from your story are like curiosity and community and mentorship, yeah. you know, and as we have people looking that want to stand out and be an expert, it's like you have to just have that curiosity. And, I, you know, I remember when we were developing the coursework for Run DNA and we were uh, developing all that stuff, it was the same thing. There was like, I remember getting up at 4.30, am for five years in a row seven days a week and just reading articles and living it and doing it and you have to have that like period of curiosity but there's so much that you learn and it it's you know i think we get along well for many reasons but like that same kind of thing that curiosity is like i don't care about being right i want the truth like i really want to know what's going on with this and and why that helped that person not just what can help them but like why did that help that person and what can inform it so yeah yeah, yeah it, it's interesting too right like you, you talk about you know the blending of the worlds right so in clinical mm -hmm. terms we talk about a cluster of tests and we kind of talk about yeah i kind of see this i kind of see that and like yeah that's not helpful right like when we sit yeah. in lab meetings and talk to with our teams and like they're a bunch of biomedical engineers, right? And biomechanical engineers. And like, when you say, I want to measure this, like, no, what's the break point? Like, where's our thresholds? What's yeah. a yes? What's a no? What's it? What's inclusion? What's an exclusion, right? And, and even the whole research paradigm, I tell my students right now, like, the cool thing about research is, like, you may not go down the research track, that's fine, but this is going to force you to think objectively, right? And set mm -hmm. thresholds on where things are going to be yes, where things are going to be no, where things, you know, where do, where does someone sit on a continuum, right? And how do we kind of get breakpoints in our decision process? And like, if you can get, I tell my students, if you get to a point where you can start to make flow charts in your brain every day, you start to develop systems, right? And all the yes to tie us together, all the dorky uh, research on on you know master clinicians and thought process goes back to can you objectify your thought process and do you th do things the same way every time so you don't miss things, right? And so I think it's a, it's a valuable exercise for anyone listening, even if you're not in yeah. in this space at all. Try and objectify your brain, right? Like find a mind mapping um, software. I'm going to put a plug in. I get nothing for this. Um, yeah called in short i n s h o r t it's mm, a, I, mean, that I think it's yeah. like 20 bucks it's it's cheap um yeah. but it's a desktop app and it literally allows you to wireframe any type of decision process you want and all you people who think oh i can do this go wireframe yourself out if you don't want to just get a piece of pen and paper but like think about some clinical assessment yeah. you use and graph out the entire thing for me and then take a pseudo patient and imagine if you could actually not be there and just make that algorithm you just wrote, that mm -hmm. wireframe, run them through your entire diagnostic evaluation and your treatment algorithm and see if that passes muster. Because that's what we have to get to in you know a research setting or a biomechanics lab type setting, right? And, and yeah. you, you will really learn a lot about yourself and kind of, again, call your own bluff. Yeah. And then, uh, like, I love that. And I would say, when you're ready, and once you've figured that out, the next step is try to teach somebody it. Right. Because then if, like, I always say, you don't really understand something, and, and you can have an idea in your head, and it makes sense in your head, because there's all these, like, subconscious connections we don't realize. When you put it on paper, the holes become widely apparent. Yeah. Then when you try to explain it to somebody else, then it's like, gaping holes there that you're like, oh, yeah, what would happen in this? Like, uh, how? so it's like the whole see one, do one, teach one kind of thing. But it's like, see one, write it down, teach, teach it there is huge, because I, I think we should I, I, the objectivity that you're talking about across all professions is important. But in the medical field, I think that that's huge. I mean, I, I will sometimes say this, like, I think having a gate lab is like having a goniometer for like, I think, you know, if you're going to look at somebody's gate, if you're going to look at walking, if you're treating ACL patients, if you're treating, uh, you know, 
OA patients, total hip, total knees, and you're not analyzing their gait, you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle. And I know a goniometer and a gait lab don't cost the same price, but they are essentially the same level of, uh, you know, you need to be looking at the objectivity to make sure that you really are getting those results that you think you are, because expertise is developed by constantly getting feedback and being able to get that. And when you have like what you were doing every day was getting feedback at UVA every single time like that worked or uh, we set this threshold here, but the last five people have been above that, but they're pain free. Why do we need to change the threshold? So, um, yeah. And, and like, you know, it's interesting. I wrote a commentary recently for, for someone in, on this idea behind, are you evidence-based, right? And, and mm -hmm. my, my, my uh, kind of run, give a spoiler for the, for the article, your patients don't care, right? Your patients want to get better. And so I think evidence-based practices guide our thought process for sure. Yeah. But what having tools allows you to do is to establish, again, data points. You're coming in today with these signs and symptoms, performance limitations, or maybe you just want to see where you are in the world, right? Like just get, right. get some reference point. And then as we do things, is the needle moving in the right direction? Because yeah. while research guides our thought process, the person in front of you wasn't in the study that you just read yesterday, right? No. They don't fit that exact inclusion criteria in that same demographic. So, you know, when you're talking about things like, you know, people say, oh, posture doesn't matter. Okay, well, let's say no, posture does matter. Your posture establishes a reference point. Gram action yeah. force basically falls somewhere in that line. The way you move dictates the mechanical demand. You can't tell me posture doesn't matter, right? And posture, right. You know, and we can measure this, right? So mm -hmm. can you modify positions that affect gait? A hundred percent. Yes, this is not, you know, so let's get our mind out the gutter of the, the social media idiots, right? And talk about reality. Um, you, yeah. know, you can modify things and it might be a time you want to temporarily Really decrease things. It might be a time you want to change form. It might be a time you want to increase tissue capacity or increase movement skill, right? Like, where does your approach fall in that window? And are you seeing things move objectively in the right direction, right? And the, and that's what these tools allow you to do. And, and that's what your patients do care about. People say, hey, I, I, I saw you, you know, whatever X number of weeks, months ago, right, for an assessment. Let's come back in again and today and see, did I actually make things better, right? And and that's where I want most clinicians' thought process to be. How can I find that? It might just be a dynamometer. It might be a goniometer. It might be a gate lab, right? Whatever tools right. you have, but make yourself more accountable for the things that you're doing. Uh, because the days of I kind of see this little wiggly thing you do when you run, that's not helpful, right? Like that's not going to give you information. It's not going to give your patients confidence things are moving in the right direction. A hundred percent. I mean, I did this little uh, thing the other day uh, on another podcast, uh, PT Pinecast. They do like 60 yeah. seconds of PT or so. And it, he asked me like all these questions. And I think I answered test for test for like half of the questions. Like, what's the biggest thing they could move in the profession? Test retest. Like, what's the thing you would tell a young professional? Test retest. Like, you have to be able to show your value and your work and to learn. I mean, it's not just about what you're showing the patient too, but it's also about how you're improving your skill set. Yep. And if you don't have the objectivity, you're not improving that skill set. And along the evidence-based lines that you said too, I'll, like I'll challenge people, maybe we'll get some comments on this here. I'm sure people will uh, will have something to say here, but name, name any research-backed method, evidence-based method that didn't start with clinical expertise. Totally. It like is... Yeah. On the spectrum of evidence-based practice, clinical expertise is the base. It is the foundation. I remember in PT school, they had that like pyramid, right? Of like, you know, RCTs and uh, reviews are at the top and then there's case studies. But like clinical expertise is at the very base and the foundation of any evidence-based approach. And if you're going, if you want to be one of those clinical experts, you got to be willing to prove it. And you got to be willing to show that that's what you're doing, which is huge. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that establishes the minutia, right. That of how we can approach research and like how yeah. you can sort of fine tune things. And, you know, we, we hosted this, um, uh, well, a, a different tangent, but yeah, it, it, it's the idea of how can we make things better. Right. And so we come at, as clinicians, we come at this as I want to help people. Right. Yeah. Engineers don't come at things that way. They go back again. Is this a binary one or a zero? Right. How yeah. can I establish this? Right. That's, I want everything to fit in a little tiny box. 
And we need to work together to talk about how we can actually arrive at those things, right? What what decisions and thought process influence where those thresholds are? And mm -hmm. that's what we need to work together. And that's what we had at UVA. And like, it's funny, I, I, was, I actually talked to two of my old co-workers. One's now a dean down in South Florida and one's uh, a uh, on faculty up at Ithaca University. And we're just talking about different things like, we had some interesting questions, right? We never really kind of answered like, we should probably write a paper on this and like push things out. So it's like, you know, those, those questions never die, right? And I think it's, it's the thing. It's like when you talk about building a good team, you're never content, right? Like no. I, I think you and I both share, like if you say, what are we doing today? It's not what I did last year or five no. years ago. I'm constantly evolving. Part of it's my ADHD and the fact that I get bored probably. But, you know, we're trying to find better ways to do what we do to get better results out of the people we work with. And 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 that is what pushes us right to to do a better job yeah. every day. And you know, I, I want my clients, my patients, my athletes to say, "Hey, like I feel better," right? Like that. That's what I want. Yeah, and that that was actually the next question I had about it. And I think a really important part of it too. You know, how much has changed since the UVA days? Like, how much of what you discovered at UVA? Like, I'm sure there are some things, and I'd love to hear if there's like you know, some really solid, you know, 10 commandments of running type things that you learn there. But, uh, you know, how much has changed from those UVA days? And how much has that methodology grown and developed since then? Yeah, so from let's take this two ways. I'll, I'll do the boring one first. People want to talk about the gate lab stuff for sure. I mean, I think that, you know, before it's, there weren't many options for gate assessment, right? I mean, you had to have, no. unless you showed up with two commas, you weren't at the table, right? Um, right. Yeah. You know, nowadays there, there's lots of systems that are, you know, research systems, which cost literally a quarter what we paid for back then. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, there's consumer and clinical grade systems, right? Which, which are a break, you know, a break point somewhere, right? So, you yeah. know, pick, pick your system. So I think there's, there's some definitely, again, you need to find some aspect of tech to integrate yeah. in your practice to do something. So that's one lesson. Um, but from the the other side, like I would say, you know, a lot's changed. And, you know, this is such a young field. Like if you look at the good, the quote, good papers on mm -hmm. game, they're from like the eighties, right? Like that's when this stuff started and the equipment was garbage back then, right? We literally <laughs> used to hand draw frames around like stick figure outlines, right? And digitize these things, right? So it's like, there's a lot of error in that, okay? Yeah. Um, and then we get better equipment, which allows us to measure things with a high degree of accuracy, right? And then we find out that, well, there's like five different ways you can do this. And so there's a lot of thought process that comes into, again, like I, I always tell people, really read that method section with a fine tooth comb, right? What they do, but then how do they do what they do? And, you know, I've been privy to a bunch of research studies. I've done them, right? So I'll give you an example. Okay. So super simple. So most of you listening probably use a Y balance uh, uh, test in your clinic, right? So yeah. what you're doing is you're basically uh, standing on one leg. We're having someone reach forward, reach uh, diagonally back to uh, contralateral side, and diagonally back to ipsilateral side, right? You measure distance. Okay. That's Hopefully a that's widely, great test. Yeah. widely used mm -hmm. test. Okay. So my students using this right now to look at um, a number of aspects on people with chronic ankle instability um, cope over time as compared to the healthy limb, right? So in last year, we did a study looking at uh, what has a greater influence on dynamic stability, intrinsic foot strength versus hip rotation strength. And we can talk about mm -hmm. that if you want, but we mm -hmm. use a Y balance test, right? So everybody out there does a Y balance test. Now, there are two primary ways people do this test. One is you basically take post-it notes, right? And when your patient reaches forward, you stick a post-it note on the ground. And when they reach backward, you stick a post-it note there and you reach a post-it note on the ipsilateral side, right? So you kind of, and you, you measure that out on your little piece of tape you have on the floor. It costs nothing, right? You can do it in right. great data. The other way you can do this is by using an FMS screen stick, right? Which is basically mm -hmm. standing on this little thing and you, you push the blocks forward, push the blocks diagonally back and diagonally back to the opposite side. Now, those are both accepted ways to do this test. But there's one huge difference between those two strategies. One of them, you're freely reaching as far out as you can in front of you. The other one, you are having a tactile cue, pushing a block to reach forward, pushing a block to reach diagonally back to each side, right? Those visual are, feedback. Yeah. Visual, well, but a tactile mm -hmm. feedback, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And so those are completely different metrics, right? And so people say, I use a wide balance test. Well, how did you do the Y balance test? Those are very, very, very different strategies, right? And people say, oh, it's all the same. It's not the same because look at all the studies in Y balance tests and papers use different, you know, 
different styles, right? So you cannot compare the ones that give you a proprioceptive cue, tactile feedback, with the ones that don't, right? Those are not the same measure of proprioception. Proprioception is right. sensory feedback, right? You see the distance, right? But you don't see the quality of movement. So we mm -hmm. also instrumented this test. We actually put um, IMU sensors on the pelvis to measure center mass um, obliquity and also rate of center of mass change as somebody does a wide balance test. So we're trying to get into again a more specific way to look at how someone controls stability as they reach, right? And so oh, yeah. I just put this out there as a way to say, we're constantly trying to ask better questions on how someone can assess the way they're moving so we get better outcomes, right? So, you know, when you talk about what's changed, a lot's changed. I'm constantly trying right. to throw bullet holes in every single thing we do and say, I don't like what we did here. I don't like what we did here. I want to change the way we did this, right? That's what we're trying to do to make things more robust and more specific. Um, and then, you know, on the... Um, on the you know the bigger picture what's changed i mean a lot's changed um you know i think that i mean let, let, again let's call it on bluff right like if you look yeah. at what i wrote in anatomy for runners the standard of care let's talk about fascial mobility right was that we were you know mobilizing tissue and breaking up scar tissue and there's still some people who say this today that was just sort of thought back in what this is 2005 2004 okay um we know now that collagen has 10 times as tensile strength of steel, right? When you do, uh, you know, a little soft tissue work in someone, you're not breaking up scar tissue, right? You are probably down-regulating neural tone, right, through some aspect of pressure feedback. Um, and you may be doing some type of, uh, you know, just by, by feedback or some type of, you know, proprioceptive, uh, proprioceptive cue, right? I mean, we don't we actually know, right? We don't. Um, right but you're not breaking scar tissue. Now we're going to say, don't foam roll and don't use a massage gun, all these other things people love to do. No, not at all. But the rationale doesn't pass muster, right? We, we know that doesn't work. So um, a, a lot's changed as far as how we approach tissue. Um, a ton has changed how we look at bone health. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and tendon problems, right? So um, I, I have a second edition in one of my books coming out um, in a, uh, about a month, um, and I completely rewrote a whole chapter on like updates in bone and tendon um, changes because uh, bone stress injuries and tendon health issues are huge, right? Endurance sports athletes and, um, you know, Running's not running and progressive increases in volume are not the way to fix these, right? Like you no. know, people say, oh, don't do too much too fast too soon. Yeah, that's true. But for every person who doesn't do too much too fast too soon, I've seen an athlete who does a great progressive graded exposure tr training plan and they break down too, right? So right. Um, these things do matter. And, you know, I think that now we're in a time where, you know, we are trying to learn. We're trying to do a better job. We're trying to evolve. And yet now we've got all these experts out there just throwing opinions left and right and huge followers because they're, you know, 20 year old with abs um doing right. social media posts. And, you know it's a lot of noise and and it's hard i mean it's hard to find the truth and we do the things and you know you can't do in in a 60 second instagram reel what you really want to get across it's impossible yeah. right so um it, it's it's challenging to get the right information in front of people today and 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 again then tie the specific information that you as an individual need and, and you as a clinician like what is your patient presenting with and how can i get the rate limiting steps in front of me right so um a ton has changed and this is great like if we talked again in 10 years i'd be like man we were stupid back then like oh yeah yeah we, we, yeah, can you believe in, yeah in 2024 we were we didn't know this about bone health and, and totally. nobody was taking this you know nutraceuticals or you know it's like oh yeah. sure, great uh, nobody knew uh, yeah. but you have to work on the best that you can right like right. i love this message and um i think what you were talking about and something obviously i'm very uh, all in on is a systematic approach to addressing some of these things because then you grow and evolve the system i'll be the yeah. first one when you need to change it you know it's it's you got to be able to adapt it but if you don't start with some type of system and some type of best available evidence whether you're creating your own whether you're learning from other people um you know then get a system evolve your system grow it over time and that makes all the world a difference of how fast you learn and then we get to share it too right and i think that that's what's getting better is that we are able you know it used to take i don't know if this has changed right but do you ever read the article that it takes 17 years for a research uh, publication to become standard of practice 
I read that, but it's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like maybe X or Twitter or whatever it is, is maybe reduced it to like 10 years or something. Who knows? That's not a study at all. That's just a speculation. But still, it, it takes forever for this to be common practice. And that's why, you know, like I love to talk to the people that are forefront, you know, the books you're, you're doing, you're redoing Running Rewired right now, right? You're doing the, Yeah. Yeah, um, great book, Fred. Like, if you don't, the first edition, awesome. Second edition, I can't wait to see it as well here. But, um, uh, you know, seeing just both, you talked about bone health and tendon health. I mean, there's just been a steady flow of really interesting research about that. If you've been paying attention over the last five to seven years, I think there's just, I, I know I've changed a lot of my thoughts on about it. Uh, you know, I think. One of those old things people used to always think is, you know, the micro trauma and, and thinking, well, what about the pull of the bone on the on the actual uh, on the bone there? And that's uh, the muscle. The muscle pull on the bone is really one of the primary things that makes those bones susceptible to these injuries. So it's not just the impact. It's the impact in a state where the bone is already weakened because bone is really good at compression, but it's not very good at tension. Oh, so. Yeah. You know, those things are things that we are learning and that informs you to say, hey, yeah, we, you know, we need to take care of the soft tissues and, and we need to look at this. And you can't just say take two weeks off and then gradually return to your activity like the example you were given. If you're not getting to the root cause, we have, oh, I don't think I still have this graphic up here, but from another show, we talked about the unique runner injury profile. Everyone has a very unique injury profile as a runner of why they actually got injured. And our job as trusted running specialist, medical fitness side there is to really try to figure out which aspects of their profile need to be addressed most. Right. And where can we, I, you know, I know you're very big on this too, um, that, uh, we've we've said you need to be fit to run, not run to be fit type thing. And I will let you go on a whole soapbox if you want on this here because I, I love your perspective as well. But like we can't just run and expect to to stay healthy and to see good performance with it. Yes, yeah, so I mean I think I'll, I'll do something to kind of tie a lot of what you just said together, right? So yeah. let's say someone comes in with a stress fracture, right? And so yep. they come in, and so. You know, again, like talking about progression, right? The old, the old us would say, "Oh, we have a stress fracture. You must have a compression problem, and you need to stop. You, we need to look at impact, right?" Well, mm -hmm. I'm not saying impact's not important because it is, but stress fractures are broken down into two categories. We have compression related stress fractures, and we have tensile related stress fractures. Which one do you have, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first question that has to happen, right? And then depending upon what that, what that answer is, there's lots of ways to, I mean, some of this you can look at generalized research on, for example, anterior tibial cortex issues are typically uh, compression related, whereas posterior medial uh, tibial stress fractures are more tensile um, and related in progression, right? That's like just a, a biomechanics and how we look at walking and running gait. Um, but someone can get a little more problematic, right? Sacral stress fractures aren't always the same for everybody. Um, fifth med head stress fractures can be impact or can be torsional or twisting type stresses, right? So you can have a stress fracture in a fifth med from two different biomechanical causes. We don't treat those people the same, right? Because they're completely different, right? One's a horse, one's a hippopotamus, right? They're not the same. Right. Um, so, um, weird animals but anyway you get my point um, so um, age, i like yeah. that uh, horse and hippopotamus they're very different yeah. yeah so um but uh so then you might say okay wait a second well now i'm going to do a gate cue because i read that you know gate cue is going to change the world right and so you may tell that athlete hey look you're overstriding i want you to to you know push out the back um a little bit more which is a great cue right to improve uh you know propulsion phase uh, of gate right it's a great cue it's a valid cue but what your patient heard was open up your stride. Yeah. And they don't know how to differentiate hip mobility from lumbar spine mobility. So yeah. you told them open up your stride. Again, great cue. They don't have the skilled motor control to do that properly. So what they did was they increased their stride length by hyperextending the lumbar spine every single stride, right? So, mm -hmm. and then people say, well, running cues are stupid. Let's break that down. No, running cues aren't stupid. They're great to reinforce strategies and skills you build in your clinic and help them transfer things into gate. There's a time and a place for them. And there's a time and a place not to use them, right? So yeah. you have to think about where is my athlete coming in? What's their movement 
you know, quality like, right? Do I have a tissue capacity problem? Do I just have to get this tissue stronger? Is this clearly just simply increasing rate of force development of the quad or of the you know, posterior tip or whatever, right? That's that's a, but I, that's what I call dumb ox training, right? Like right. figure out a way to load the system and go for it, right? Or do I have a really poor motor control issue going on, right? So if I've got a situation where I've got somebody who's quote weak or has rate of force development problems, I can train strength and power. And that's a time you can kind of jump in. Those athletes typically have good body awareness, right? You can say, hey, look, let's kind of rob Peter to pay Paul right now. Let's actually modify some things to allow you to maintain some aspect of volume, but still minimize load to the involved area, right? As we work on increasing tissue capacity, that's one scenario which works out beautifully. There is another scenario which says, hey, look, the way you're moving is really, you're driving drunk, okay? Uh, yeah. and, and right now, increasing, you know, progressive increases in load intensity and volume are not smart, right? In fact, we need to find the least minimum volume I can put you at to maintain your fitness. And maybe I'm doing other modes of training right now to maintain your fitness mm -hmm. while we're also attacking this movement quality problem, right? And then we're building a muscle memory repertoire, right? We're building those motor engrams, learning how to move better, right? And then we can actually what? load tissue capacity in that new pattern, and then we can actually train rate of force development, and then we can get back to sports specific training with the proper cues, right? A longer journey, still great success, but a complete different way to approach that, right? So that's why I'm saying if you have metrics to go back and say, where does this patient fall in a continuum? These answers are ridiculously easy. You know, I joked yeah. at the time, like in a gate lab, your job is so simple. <laughs> You've yeah. got objective data in front of you to go, here's where you are. Here's where I'd like you to be, right? Like it's, yeah. it's right in front of you. It tells you what to do. And if you don't have those metrics, it's a lot to figure out where to am I going to be, right? So you have to find ways to look at what do I want to look at? Where should I have this person be? And so it's a, a lot's changed and, and, yeah. and lots of thinking progress, thinking process has changed to find out what does this patient individually need? What's my N of one, right? right. Um, but that's all that matters. It it is right that person in front of you they they need results for them and you've got to pull from your background your experience the literature to really provide them a personalized program and yep. do that as quickly and and I can't stress enough like if there's young clinicians that are listening to this and are like wow okay you know uh, these ball guys you know obviously have a lot of experience here uh, how do us you know haired people that are still young coming out of school develop it it's like don't Jealous. be afraid yeah 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 <laughs> um, you know don't be afraid like learn from other people get involved like get Jay's book take courses do these things like that like learn from other people it's not st like steal from them but like give them some credit where credits do type thing but just you know that's our whole thing we're we're really focused on building community this year too is just let's get everyone together and let's have that's why we're doing this podcast let's have these conversations and see what that spurs and inspires people on because you're going to take a different look from it just like you had that group at uva that was engineers and they're more focused on the process they're going to take a different look from it they're I, f I forget the name of the book uh, but it was basically generalist versus specialist and it compared like federer to tiger woods yep. uh, and how the two were were very respective and you know the the response from the book was like in certain situations you need very specific knowledge in other situations you need very general knowledge know when to combine the two and see how you can put that together and just keep growing and, and keep learning it's i i I think that we have such a great profession and I think that working with runners is so exciting because there is never a time where I feel like I know everything that there is to know about runners. There's, every time I learn something, it spurs five more questions. And that's what's really fun about running is that there's so much involved with it and walking gate as well. Uh, you know, it's like there's so much involved and it's so fun that you can have a lifetime of learning and still know that you're not going to have the answers at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, this is interesting. I'm going to tie in one little quote. So, uh, 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 Frank Shorter way back when, right. He uh, came and gave a keynote at a conference that, uh, I put on, uh, at UVA and, um, it was awesome to hear him him talk about his personal journey, right? I mean, one of the better runners of all time, right? And yeah. and he's like, you know, it's funny. He goes, you ask me what I'm pretty pumped about these days. Because yeah, I still run, but he goes, I'm old, right? Like I, I'm 60 and I'm not getting faster. And he goes, you know what? The gym's really awesome. 
Because I'm yeah. somebody who never really did this before. He's like, I can still see progress, right? And so one of the big things, like, I, I will just, as a, a little pearl to give everybody today, like runners are volume and pace obsessed, right? And, yes. and that's not helpful, right? At all, at no. all, right? Um, I, I always go back to this quote, you know, Joe V. Hill, one of the winningest, and Jack Daniels, right? The, the two winningest coaches in U.S. history, right? Produced more world championship gold medals than anybody else. If you ask them, how many miles a week does someone need to run to go to the Olympics to win a gold medal? And they will tell you as least miles as it takes. There is no standard to say you have to run 80 or 120 miles a week. No. Runners think this exists. It does not. Okay. No. It will tell you quality trumps everything. Right. And so I'm constantly trying to get my runners to reframe the idea behind progress as quality, right? Not just quantity. Okay. Yeah. And so what type of numbers can you hit in terms of your speed work? Cause like, that's a great quality metric, right? Like mm -hmm. how fast can you run before your form breaks down? This is not a simple question to ask, but if there are certain metrics that you're working with your patient, like, Hey, I want you to focus on this, right? This might be something you're doing audibly, visually. It might be a gait analysis tool. It might be something you're measuring in your clinic, right? And how fast can we get things to go before form breaks down? And can you note, can your patient notice the point where their form starts to shift and can they rework themselves into that preferred movement path for them right so yeah. these are type of things i try and get my patients to focus on because they can see progress and everyone loves progress right and so when you can put your focus on the right things that's really helpful right and that's how you get this stuff to stick i mean i tell my patients i never want to see you again when I, I i do not want to work with you again i want you to be pain free forever right so that means that when i say goodbye it's not just okay, I'll go back to what I was doing before. It's no, what are the things that have been important for me individually to work on? And how can I make sure I carry those goals and think, you know, strategies forward as I go to progress? And that's what we're looking to do, right? We just want to change people and put the focus on the right things that they actually need. Exactly. Yeah. Minimum, minimum effective dosage is yep. something I have been all about and you know, exactly what you talk about there. And this actually transitions to my next little like case I wanted to talk to you about there too. It's like quality over quantity. And I think it's really hard now because Strava, social media, everyone, even the pros are watching the other pros and seeing what they're doing. And you're looking and the recreational runners, if they're going to do a 5k and their buddy, they're like watching what they're doing like oh they're doing a 10 mile long run i need to do a 10 mile long run and it's not the same and everyone's different and you have to figure out your own formula of what that magic form is that's going to keep you healthy and performing well and that's the fun of the sport uh, you know and you have to be willing to take a step back sometimes to take two steps forward so that's a really important message i, I have a quick quick uh random story to share here yeah. this is one of the things that like just like those moments in your career kind of stick with you, right? Like I was at a track one day with uh, a handful of athletes I work with and two of them were Olympians. Uh, one was an All-American and like they're just crushing splits, right? Like just, yeah. I mean, and, and it was a community workout. So anybody could show up and do, it was other people um, doing workout in the track to that day. And um, I, I laughed because after workout, like my athletes on the floor are kind of just, you know, doing some mobility, mobility work or whatever. And some people walked over and were talking to him. Oh, what type of shoe are you in? And, you know, I like these shoes, no shoes and, and asking all these gear questions, right? And like clothing things and like, and one of them turned to me and said, if these people had any idea how much hard work it takes to run splits like this, I think they just quit. Right. And so we're attracted to the, the, the shiny stuff, right? Like that's not where the magic happens, right? The magic happens in, Hey, if you want to run these type of splits, I have to show up ready to absolute crush my VO2 max workouts, right? With this amount of intensity and, and like hundred percent concentration. And if you can't do that, everything else just crumbles down right and so it's it's that mindset of like can i put the ultimate aspect of quality into those key workouts that really defines who wins and who doesn't yeah and the other thing is it doesn't happen overnight either oh. running progress is measured in years not in even weeks you, yeah. you do a 16-week marathon tra training program you're just really tuning up some of the fitness that you've developed over the last two or three years it's not right. how you develop the fitness 
No. So things take a lot longer. So yeah, along those lines, you know, because as you could hear, you know, Jay works with some of the top athletes in the world, but also just regular recreational runners as well. Um, so, you know, it'd be really interesting to share kind of this case. This is, uh, and see your thoughts on this and hear maybe some practical like takeaways and how you look at patients and, and consider those things. But this person's a sub four minute miler, sub 13, 25 K runner, uh, history of chronic Achilles issues bilaterally, right, worse and left most of the time. Um, most right now, most of the Achilles pain is resolved, but they get persistent soleus tightness, especially after anything on the track or it's pretty much guaranteed after a race where they're spiked up and they're running really hard. They're going to get this quote unquote soleus tightness, which can irritate the Achilles if it goes on more than two or three days with it. So, you know, just some of the objective findings, there's a lot of objective findings, but some of the more relevant ones, let me know if you need other ones here, but limited mobility in tail core joint, um, navicular, like midfoot kind of mobility, um, it's improving, but not uh, exactly a uh, gymnast in some of the flexibility there uh, or mobility. But then um, balance is actually pretty good, despite a lot of gripping with the toes. Um, he's been doing some heavy, slow resistance for gastroc soleus, as well as just soleus raises in a variety of positions to help engage the glutes a little bit more. When he does like a, a soleus raise in a bridge, it looks, you know, like... Uh, uh, church revelation moment there, you know, lots of shaking going on. Um, and the one last kind of thing is he reports that if he does any stability work, his soleus really fatigues out quickly and he feels flat for a few days here. So, you know, what other information or what, like, what are you saying? I, Doug, you need to tell me this other information. Like, what are you dying to look at? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on what you would do for a program with this or where you would start with an athlete like this if they kind of came in? I know there's a lot of like, it depends or I need more information. So sure. feel free to start with that. And then we can talk a little bit about just some of your thoughts. Yeah. So uh, a few things. So you mentioned ankle dorsal flexion is lacking. What, what are we talking about? What's this peak range? Uh, so five degrees on the right, 10 degrees on the left with wow. me straight. So uh, yeah. Nice. So, but by like the end of the treatment, he'll be 12, 13 degrees, um, with just some tail core joint mobilizations and a little bit of soft tissue. He restores it pretty quickly. Okay, um, but, that, yeah. that block is anterior. It's, it's arthrokinematic. And, not, yeah. yeah okay. It's arthrokinematic. Yeah. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, and then, uh, upstream, um, what does, uh, like, uh, torso and pelvis rotation look like? Yeah. So, uh, really, when we first started working together, there was a lot of genu valgus like collapsing in uh, with mechanics there. Um, pretty consistent like reports of like um, PSIS, you know, related pain there. He gets a lot of that and definitely some limitations, a lot of cueing, like anytime we're doing any foot stuff, there's always the cueing of like, you know, don't let the knees collapse in excessively there. You know, there's some, but you know, don't excessively collapse in. He'll, he'll pretty, significantly go in hip rotation isn't bad actually from an arthrokinematic standpoint there like soft tissue wise he gets pretty uh, restricted in some mobility thing especially like glute attachment at the it band is always just a hot spot for him and he has trouble controlling some of that but i mean uh the first time we ever had him like jump or do anything it was like knees you know, hard knock together. And now he's got much better control over it, but it's still conscious at times for him. Okay. Um, and, uh, so let's go, the foot's not a brick, right? It's multi nope. system. So have you, have you, what's, what's midfoot look like? Midfoot. Um, so he can do like you know, arch doming type exercise. Like he's got fair control over that. Um, like midfoot mobility can be a, a bit of an issue for him and even getting him a little bit like toe yoga exercises, banded toe yoga kind of exercises. He really struggles to keep that um, first ray kind of in contact yeah. there. Yeah. All right. And then, um, as I was suspecting, okay. And then um, what does, uh, so in, um, is there any significant forefoot or rear foot barris going on? Um not significant not that's uh, like no not not very like rigid pretty overall pretty good there okay um and um 
All right, calcaneal inversion, eversion. He is good with mobile. I do mobilize it on him a bit there where like eversion is actually a little limited at times there. Yeah. We'll, we'll take him and he's, he can have a little limited um, calcaneal eversion. And we'll, we do a lot of like standing mobilizations and, and um, you know, just mobilizations to help out with that. Okay. Um, definitely. Start, okay. So, there's more I could I would like to pig into too, but uh, oh, yeah. stab at this for sure. Um, this person definitely puts a pattern I see often. Um, so what what this person's doing, like you said, they, they're good at doming, right? And they're they're mm -hmm. long flex dominant. And so a few things are happening here. Um, one, um, when you run, you're supposed to be able to progress center mass over the foot, right? So mm -hmm. if he's got limited dorsal flexion, right? So you have three options. One is you can cut your push off short, right? You can yeah. spin out. Or you can spin in actually four options, or that hypomobility at the ankle can basically cause what um, increased mobility within the midfoot, right? So mm -hmm. these people typically don't want to let that happen. So what they do is they basically dome up when they actually lift their first med up off the floor and they run way on the outside of the foot, right? And this leads to um, can lead to a forefoot supinatus type situation where a bunch of soft tissues underfoot are sort of sh uh, shortening, adapting, and you get stiffness through um, the cuboid, the fourth and your fifth um, uh, uh, metatarsals. So I'd yeah. spend some time checking those to see if those are mobile. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and see what that looks like if i can get that individual to flatten out the first ray of contact just in standing right just stand single leg yeah i think we have people say hey look don't tell them anything just stand on one leg and where do you feel your weight right is it more in the outside of your foot more evenly split across the med heads or or actually falling to the inside and literally falling in like these people actually fall over sometimes right so this person sounds like somebody who's probably going to be a lateral foot type person right because mm -hmm. their, their compensation is to wobble on the outside and when you put a shoe on them they can sort of roll off the outside um, but when you make this person work their foot right they start to get calf problems because they they lack dorsiflexion right it's trying to basically push the foot further down but then they're trying to use long flexors to grip and curl up again that's not going to work and so Let's talk about something biomechanically, which doesn't get near enough attention. Um, Excited if, for that. So if you invert your rear foot, the transverse tarsal joint will mm -hmm. what? Drop down to give yep. you first ray contact. If yep. you evert the rear foot, your transverse tarsal joint's gonna rise up and lock out and become rigid. And so mm -hmm. when you combine the fact that from mid stance and a push off, this person is likely lacking dorsiflexion in, in, at their ankle, as we said, right? That's yeah. going to cause their rear foot to what? To basically uh, collapse, to, to basically move into more everted position, right? Which makes yeah. the midfoot want to drop, right? That's going to lock out the tarsal joint. That's going to cause them to, again, like have only two options. Either A, fall in visibly, right? You'll see it's actually very pronounced. Or B, just roll off the outside of the foot. So we've got to do work to allow the, to improve the calcaneal eversion, right? To to let that first met head settle down, okay? And as we go from mid stance in a push off, remember your heels off the ground at this point in time, right? That rear foot needs to be able to adequately, you know, move from an everted position to an inverted position. And at the same time, the foot torsions, right? It twists on itself to get that first ray purchase. And that's gonna happen from, again, controlling that rear foot eversion mobility. So what mm -hmm. I would do with this person is um, basically I would do a few things from a mobility standpoint, I'd keep working on ankle dorsal flexion. They need that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd probably have them do some type of self mode before each run at the ankle. Mm -hmm. um, I would mobilize fourth and fifth and cuboid, right? See if what that does in terms of that contact point. I do some soft tissue release um, under the uh, lateral band of the plantar fascia to see if that can sometimes that can cause some issues. Again, you're not breaking up scar tissue, but um, you'll be amazed what some soft tissue mobility work can do to kind of again chill the nervous system out and help that first rate drop properly. Um, yeah. And then I'd spend a lot of time in static everted training with these people mm. okay so um everted position is going to force load over to what over to the first met right and they're going to have yeah. so now they're in this diagonal position so when i'm in that diagonal position it's going to make me yes have to press down but also have to target my abductor halysis right to drive yep. the first ray into abduction and depression and build that arch strength back up and you can't be long flex with dominant there right that's not going to work no. um I spent a lot of time working everted positions and doing kind of you know kettlebell pass arounds, right? So um, in in a, in an everted position, take a ten pound kettlebell, right, and just have him pass it from left hand to right hand, right hand to left hand, for like three minutes. Okay, his foot will probably be on fire. Um, and the thing is, there's no mechanical. There's, well, 
not no, there's very minimal to get mechanical demand on the soleus in that position. So we can train a lot of intrinsic foot sparing a lot of propulsion yeah. mechanics, right? And and I would probably do some Mobo stuff, but I don't want to make this commercial for Mobo. Um, but he's um, doing Mobo stuff. I can tell you that. <laughs> Not a, uh, you know, yeah, he's he's doing that. Yep. Yeah. So uh, on the Mobo, I do two things. One, um, if he's doing Mobo, if he's doing calf raises on Mobo, okay. Um, again, there's a cutout for little toes, so as you push off, you you can't use that gripping strategy. Right? It's going to cue him yep. to push off. But um, there's exercise I call foot screws. Um, I've you, I, I, I literally started doing these just for these type of people right who tend to kind of have this imbalance in foot torsion so mm -hmm. the way you do a foot screw you don't need a mobo or anything for this by the way just uh, you need something just uh, something to hold on to um yeah. i'll guide you through it and you can if those of you listening home can do this with me so you need to stand on both feet okay so we're going to start bilateral standing both feet and i want you to feel again you should do all your manual work or soft tissue work you need to get even contact with the med heads across the floor you may have to actually take your hands and tactically cue the patient to evert the rear foot, right? And that's okay, right? But to evert, I'm excuse me, sorry, invert the rear foot, okay? Um, so you may, again, you may passively guide them into inversion, keeping first ray contact down. That's a critical thing here because remember that foot needs to torsion, right? If the, if this alone is too hard for them, cut a little piece of TheraBand, stick it on underneath the right uh, first bet and underneath the left first mat just to force them to have to drive down, right? To get that tactile cue, but you're going to have them Invert the rear foot, rise up onto toes like doing a calf raise. Once they're in there, not peak position, let's say maybe 50 degrees of plantar flexion, right? You're going to now have them actively evert the rear foot, mm -hmm. then actively invert the rear foot back to where it was again, and then come back down mm -hmm. and then relax. And that's one rep. And so what you're doing is you're training that idea behind foot torsion with propulsion mechanics, right? To build a pattern of, can I actually keep my first ray grounded and stable as I'm trying to invert and evert the rear foot? Because what happens is during propulsion mechanics, again, I think my hypothesis is your patient's spinning off the lateral foot and not able to get things properly loaded through the first met. And then when you have them do exercises, they're like, I can do this and just grab extra, uh, long flexor dominant. And that's basically causing the calcaneus to what? Ebert, which is putting yep. Achilles and the soleus in a longer position and causing more strain. That's why they're feeling uh, sore after. So I probably would go that route for right now and see if that gets you any, any improvement. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's um, the tr <laughs> The manual, as you said, was literally our last treatment together here. So that yes. made me feel good. Like, it's like, that's all we did actually that whole time. But I really like that exercise because it is going to help them to train it now. So I'm a big gait guy here, right? Like what's the gait part of that? You know, because mobility and ability is, or mobility and stability are not ability, right? So are we right. just looking to increase the capacity of this um, or do we cue as well? Yeah, for sure. So um, I would say there. All right. So, um, well, I'd say it's, this falls under the skill of movement category more than anything mm -hmm. else, more yeah. than a capacity issue. Yes, you can always improve capacity, right? You can always improve right. that. But um, from the gate cue standpoint, um, there are a few things you can try. First of all, like where are we in the realm of overstride? Are we okay? Are we, because again, with like limited door flexion, sometimes that contact point gets kicked forward a whole lot. Has significantly improved. Um, but there is still, um, on the most affected side, tibial inclination is the last thing that we just can't like his, his overall strike from center of mass is reduced, but he's still in a bit of like a flexed tibial position there so that he's more like the foot landing further out in front of him with that. What our system calls like tibial inclination flexion. Yep. Um, he's at about five to seven degrees, depending on the speed as he goes faster, it gets a little higher um, as opposed to zero where we would like like him, he's at about five to seven degrees. Okay. So what you can do, um, there's a company called Stroops that makes little elastic band stuff like their band. And they used yeah. to make these things. And I still have a pair and they don't make them anymore. It bums me out. We can do the same thing with Coban. Okay. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to take Coban and just right, make a little cuff uh, around the okay. calf just below the knee. Okay. Then okay. you're going to take another piece of Coban and you're going to basically loop it from that top. So you make a little circle around the calf, right? So it's an end yep. point. Then take a piece of Coban and basically you're going to 
uh, anchor at the top and then have it come down all the way to the laces in the front of their shoe. So you're basically creating a little dynamic AFO. If that makes sense. Okay. okay you put yep. A little tension on there. And yeah, the system tension, door protection for exactly. people following along that aren't seeing the seeing our hand motions here. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You might want to watch this one too instead of just listen to it here. We got lots of hand motions going on yeah. here for uh, for people listening to the podcast. Yes. So the Coban is, is basically giving you a dorsiflexion assist, right? It's trying to pull yeah. the toes up. Okay. So mm-hmm. when you pull the toes up, right, what you do is you kind of change the geometry of how that foot swing occurs in front and center of mass, right? And so right. if you pull the toes up, that's going to have the, the, the leg spring mass for all my dorky biomechanic people out there, but it's going to bring that contact limb closer to center of mass at contact, right? So um, I would use that to see if you can, again, get shin angle is what you're trying to do. You're trying to bring mm-hmm. that shin angle more vertical. So I would try that, number one. Um, and then number two, so um, again, we don't talk about just sagittal plane loads. We also have to think about um, what, hap- what happens in terms of um, uh, diagonal loads because, yeah. uh, yeah. because what isn't a frontal plane joint right then you got yeah. those joints are in lots of different axes so um or, or conjoint axes so um the other thing which can help and you have to be careful with this one but once your athlete gets good at getting first ray grounded you can have them cue to basically land and this is subtle but try and get them to basically evert just before landing okay mm-hmm. And what that's going to do, again, they're used to kind of reaching and almost like pawing at the ground, right, to try and get that stride length. And if you have them cue on slightly evert in the rear foot, okay, again, so this is where your everted training comes in, right? So, again, we don't use gate cues in isolation. You spent time doing the everted pass around. Patients can actively do that little, um, that foot screw exercise, right? They know how to mobilize and actively control rear foot on forefoot. Now you can start to get that cue in a gate. See if you say, hey, look, try and evert just prior to contact, right? You, that will also cue the foot strike close to the center mass. Um, and it's going to give a more solid um, contact because um, you can actually sort of use the spring in the arch uh, landing versus just the yeah, So uh, those are two. theory that, that they're probably landing excessively inverted. So or like with this, right? Like you're you're thinking that they're landing excessively inverted in this position. So you might not actually see them land everted, but they're just reducing some of the inversion as opposed to being in an uh, everted position at initial contact, but just to engage and, and use some of that, like getting the foot in contact with the ground a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, these these people typically the gripper is usually right lacking dorsiflexion. They're mm-hmm. extrinsic dominant. They're going to get some additional stride length by reaching forward a little bit, you know, with it with a positive shin inclination angle or you yeah, know, say negative in your system. Sorry, what, what do you say? Uh, so we use flexion and extension. So it's right. like a flexed uh, t- tibia position. Yeah. Yeah, which yes. is positive. So, yeah. Uh, yes. yeah, positive. Positive tibia inclination angle, yeah. right? They're going to have a little bit more inverted rear foot, and they're going to basically have more plantar flexed ankle, right? So you're trying to bring that into less inversion, right? And yes. then dorsiflexion, right, to bring that foot contact closer to the center mass to kind of use those strategies you built into the gate. Um, yeah. and, and I, I would try that um, for sure. Will the, you know, I never thought about it this way. I've always thought about the mitered hinge aspect of the foot and the tibia as from the foot up. But if you change the shin position, could you actually get the reverse where if you're in a more, uh, for people, if you're not, like I know tibial inclination is, is sometimes confusing for people if if you haven't really looked at a lot of biomechanical data. It's like, it's a it's not quite the same, but it's like a fancy way to look at like knee flexion at initial contact, basically there too. Like there, there's more nuance to it there, but basically a, a more flexed knee is going to lead to a more vertical shin position. Most of the time there just for simplicity's sake, we'll generalize it. Um, so I wonder if being in more of that neutral shin angle will just have the effect on the inversion, eversion aspect of that just because you're getting the shin in that better position and it's a mitered pinch joint, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Another yeah, reason... I mean, 
tying it back to why you have to be able to measure, right? Because if you're not measuring <laughs> it, if you're just looking at the shit, and if you don't have any ability, you know, to measure uh, rear foot inversion, eversion, you don't know if it did. And then if you start cueing them all of a sudden to evert, then you might be excessively doing it there. That's why you have to be able to measure. And I always say the unintended consequences. When you yep. do gate, like that's one of the coolest things is you'll fix one thing. And when you find the right cue, like everything cleans up. You find, and it's, and I've never used the tape actually aspect of it. I do a crazy cue where I actually tape a paper towel roll to their shin and I tell them to land with the paper towel roll pointed forward in the direction that they're running. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like a different external cue, but I use taping for collapsing mechanics to give them that proprioceptive feel of what we're looking for. But I've never done it for that. So I, I'm going to have a new cue next time uh, doing it there. I like it. Yeah, if Stroops, if you're watching, please make these straps. You used to make them before. <laughs> yes, yeah. Are they, were those called the gate, right? Were they? Uh, no, they were, just, they were called like Stroops ankle straps or something. But yeah, they were basically, it was a it was a neoprene cuff with just a little yeah. Velcro strap around it, right, to give you a cuff at the top. But again, this is top of the shin, right below the knee. Uh, and they had a, just a TheraBand with clips on each side, yeah. just basically little clips in. So it was a clip on top, and basically you just would go from the top one, right, and you clip it down. Um, to the to the uh the front lacing of your shoe right just give you yeah. a little bit of a dorsiflexion flexion cue um mm -hmm. and it's a great little strategy for again your over strider kind of again plantar flexed inverted people right to bring them back yeah. a little bit of dorsiflexion flexion and change that shin angle um it's a great little strategy and it, it's not pulling up a ton right but it's yeah. and most of the cue occurs during a swing phase right but yeah again going back towards you know people say oh internal cues are horrible and external cues have to do everything they both have a place, right? The more right. you can give someone an environment where they mm -hmm. can feel things differently, the more I can shut my mouth and let them feel yes. things. That's how they learn, right? So if if you're getting, if you're saying four words, that might not be the most helpful strategy versus if you're actually giving them something they can feel, wow, I'm feeling my foot get pulled up a little bit more right. every single stride, right? And go run miles. Like this isn't something yeah. you do like in the clinic. Go run a few miles and come back and say, hey, how do you feel, right? And then, you know, how much do you have to use that strategy before things start to become a little bit more ingrained? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, um, the secret that's not so secret to gait analysis is like the cues actually don't matter. It's them feeling the difference in the form right. that matters. All you're trying to do is to get them to feel the difference and their brain will say, Ooh, me like, you know, and it, and then it'll adopt it and they can replicate the feel much better than the cue where you're eventually going to take the tape off, but they're going to remember what it felt like to run with the tape on yeah. or the Coban here. And it's like that, is the whole point is just to let them experience the feel of it because that's way easier to replicate and they look at you like you're crazy like you want me to tape this to my shin and you want me to knee a soccer ball or to run into the wind like what, what are you talking about and then oh this feels different yes replicate the feel that's the whole goal of of any gate modifications yeah, I mean, I've, again, so two examples right here, right? So you can use audible feedback, right? So this is, I'm going back forever ago with our system, right? Back at EVA, but you know, you, if we had a patient come in one time. I, I remember distinctly because I made a case scenario about it, but like first time I'd ever done this, so it was cool. But um, I basically set um, limits on his hip, uh, on his hip internal rotation, right? And every time he hit a certain target, I basically played a tone. I said, hey, run, don't hear the bell, right? That's all I told him. I, I, I don't want to tell him, do this, just figure out how not to make the bell ring. Right. And, yeah. and basically he just figured it out. He's like, I, the bell's annoying. Bell go away. He figured out how to control rotational position of his hip. Super simple. Right. Um, visual feedback I use all the time. I'll show patients a graph. I won't tell them yeah. what the X and Y coordinates are. I'm like saying, Hey, do me a favor, shift this curve this way, push it that way, make yeah. it go on this side of the line. Right. Yeah. I don't care how you do it. Figure out how to do it. Right. They figure it out and they come back and go, Oh, wow. Like I had a patient, you know, this was a loading rate patient. She was, um, case study I teach with often, but um, she had the highest loading rate I've ever measured of any patient in my entire lab. She was a 12-year-old yeah. girl who weighed under 80 pounds, right? And all I told her was make the graph go down, right? Yeah. And she ran that way for like 15 minutes and she left. And she came back two weeks later. I said, hey, run again, right? And kids are great because they're so plastic, right? They can learn <laughs> easy. But um, she came back in like, she was like, 92% as good as she was when I showed her the, the you know, real-time feedback two weeks prior, right? So it's like, 
if you let somebody figure out how to do what you want them to do, they'll organize their system and learn properly, right? If you give too many commands, it's like, mm -hmm. if, I, if I lose one of those commands or a strategy, I fall apart and that's not helpful. It's too much to think about. So your cues mm -hmm. need to be simple, but again, cues should reinforce strategies. If you're giving someone a new cue that they don't know how to perform in you know, a static standing position, your cues are too hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, it's this is just what makes it so fun. I mean, what you're just talking about the live biofeedback. I mean, that was the thing when we were building our system that uh, it was just focused on the analysis for the first couple of years we had it. And then all of a sudden, like a light bulb switch and it's like, oh, the gate retraining aspect is actually the real value here. Like, it's cool to see it. But then just all like it makes it it's it's not cheating, but it's cheating. I just put my finger in and be like, don't let this line hit my finger. And then they're like, oh, oh, that's what you wanted me to do. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, it's like, it's fun. It's just fun to nerd out and do that stuff. I can't believe this is what I get to do for a living. But um, we're fortunate. So, yeah. yeah. Jay, this is awesome. I um, I always learn something every time I talk to you. And and I uh, can't wait to read the book, the new book here. I'd, I'd love to see. I think, Jay, uh, hopefully you can see from this conversation, has a really great ability to not just understand some of these complex things, but I think he does a really good job of then putting it into actionable steps where we say, hey, here's what you need to do. And that's why I wanted to do the case at the end here just to see Jay's brain about how you say, okay, there's all these complex things we talked about and, the, you know, the test for test and the measure and those things but hey here's what you got to do that person standing in front of you and i think as a clinician researcher you understand that that sometimes the researchers and they, when you don't have somebody standing and saying well what do i do next type thing you you don't always develop that ability to say oh yeah all right now here's what i need to do so highly recommend checking out all of jay's resources and products and we have uh, when's the launch of the new book here uh, april, when's that coming out? yeah it'll be april 16th and uh those of you who are curious who do that, thank you for everybody who got the first version of the book. But um, there, there are sort of three things that are uh, different in the new book. Um, one is um, the actual part. Uh, some people said the some of the exercise uh, routines took a little bit too long. So some of those are reorganized a little bit. All the mm. precision workouts are actually the same. Um, but uh, the performance workouts, I, I simplified some things. So they'll take you less time. Um, and they were reworked to still give you like very targeted progressive goals. Um, that's one thing. Um, again, there's a whole new chapter on, um, on on basically building better parts, right? And that's really, really, really important. Again, the, the first edition was targeted towards the skill. There's still tons of content on that. Um, uh, but then, uh, yeah, we get into building better parts and, and specific strategies and interventions you can do to increase tendon health and bone health and not just doing sets and reps, but talking about how fast those reps are and why the speed of each rep matters if you're trying to bias different tissue, right? Um, and then uh, the third thing is... Um, a lot of people are conf confused on like how, I, I I thought I had a pretty good recipe as far as like when to put these workouts and how to structure them. Mm -hmm. But lots of questions over the years on like, well, I'm this and I'm this and I had this going on. So I put a bunch of scenarios out and said, hey, look, if you're a master's runner, here are some ways you might not bias things versus as far as when you're doing these workouts in conjunction with your physiological training. Um, and then if you're a, a, an age grouper, right? If you're a weekend warrior, yeah. how to kind of bias things and as far as what you need. So I try to make it a little simpler. Um, there's some case scenarios, change some different things. So Hopefully it's it's a more actionable product, right? I tell people, thank you for reading. I don't care if you read it. I care if you do it. So um, yeah. if you put that in practice, you will greatly improve your resiliency and durability. Actionable books are the best ones. So yeah. yeah. Well, Jay, thank you for all you do for the profession. Thank you for uh, being on here. What uh, What's the best way if people do want to like follow you more or get a hold of it? Like what's the, what's the best way to learn about like your book launches and things? Yeah, um, I, I'm uh, so yeah, I'm not the best on all these things, <laughs> um, but yeah, you can follow uh, Mobo. It's Mobo dot board um, on Instagram. Um, I simply put most things there. Uh, you can also follow me. I'm just Jay Desherry Instagram, um, and then you can also uh, go to anathletesbody.com. Um, I haven't updated that in a while, but I'm going to start put more stuff on there, and then uh, mobileboard.com as well. So between all those, um, and I try and put things in the mobile board newsletter. It's 100 free. It's not mobile board stuff. I share interesting things on um, different type of diagnoses, different type of skill building, how music affects motor learning, all kind of different things, just to try and get better things. You can sign up for free at mobileboard.com uh, website. So thanks. Nice.
Jay, appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for being on, and and hopefully we'll have you on again here. I think there's a lot of things we could go down, so appreciate the time. Such a good chat, Doug. Thanks. Like what you hear? Leave a review of the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Run DNA helps runners and running specialists through education and technology to identify each runner's unique injury profile to avoid setbacks and maximize results. The Run DNA podcast is produced by Ace Running LLC. The Run DNA podcast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can occur. Always seek the guidance of qualified medical professionals before making healthcare decisions. Find us online at rundna.com.